VoiceOver Coffee Shop, Episode 15. Welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we share our morning with some of the finest names in voiceover. And now, here's your host, voice actor Andrew Morrison. Hi there, my name is Andrew Morrison, and welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we start our day with some of the finest names in voiceover. If you'd like to know more about me, feel free to visit my personal website at www.voicebard.com. In this episode, we have coffee with my dear friend, Morgan Berry. Morgan is a voiceover artist and singer, known for her work in My Hero Academia, Pokemon, Sword Art Online, Final Fantasy, Borderlands 3, Fairy Tale, and honestly, too many video games, anime, and web series to count. In this episode, we talk about how she got started in ADR dubbing, the differences between voiceover and stage acting, gaining exposure using social media, and the recording process for working on a Funimation production. Hey, Morgan, how are you? Hi, I'm doing good. <laughs> good. So how do you take your coffee? Lots of cream and sugar. <laughs> <laughs> I like my coffee super sweet. So how did you get started in the voiceover industry? Uh, I've been acting for about 17 years now, and it all started with school theater and a local performing arts company. And then I stumbled into voiceover after winning a voice acting competition that was being judged by Todd Haverkorn. And so that's how I got my foot in the door with voiceover. <laughs> okay, did that transition you straight into ADR work? Yes. <laughs> that was my first, my first ever voiceover gig was in fairy tale okay yeah one of my favorite anime shows okay so um when you, you were you were familiar with acting so how did the on-stage acting versus the voiceover acting what were some of the major differences in that well there's a major difference because with on stage and on camera you have the costumes the lighting you have everything you can see it all the whole set is in front of you and it creates that picture. It paints it for you. But in voiceover, there are some gigs where you there's you don't even get to see any art of the characters, right. nothing. Sometimes you, you're just given a script, no pictures, nothing. So you're not really given as much, you have to paint the picture yourself basically. And you have to rely all on your vocal cords instead of your facial expressions and your body language. Now you have to channel all of that into your voice. And sometimes that's a little difficult to translate. And so a lot of the times when I'm in a booth, I find that physicality is very important to channel certain emotions, certain actions that the character might be doing in the scene. Um, and of course, one of the simpler examples of that would be smiling. Because we can hear when you're smiling through a mic. We can hear it. We may not be able to see you. We may not be able to see it, but we can hear it. So there's a lot of the times where I have to, you know, I have to channel all of my experience as an, an on-camera and on-stage actor and use bits and pieces from that in, in voiceover, but channel it all through my vocal cords <laughs> and my facial expressions, of course. Right. So you've done a lot of different roles. What were like some of the roles that kind of resonated with you a little bit more where you just saw the script and you're like, oh no, no, this is me. This, this, is, this is my character. Ooh, there's been a few like that. Oh my goodness. Okay, so this one is really close to my heart. Um, Kasai-san and Morning Glories. I voiced for Kasai-san. Gotcha. And that show... Kasei-san and Morning Glories is about two girls who fall in love and they're in a relationship and it's so cute and I just it reminded me of a past relationship um, at the time and oh my gosh there was just so many similarities with the characters and myself and the person I was I was dating at the time and so it was just really it hit home for me <laughs> and I was just, oh every scene I was like oh my gosh it's me and I I have never related to a character more than Kasai-san so that was pretty cool gotcha 
So when you see a character, um, when, when you do kind of just get a couple of, um, a couple of descriptors, and because and, in ADR work, it's very, very technical work, but you can kind of see what the character looks like on the screen. But when they're working with video games, generally, at least in my case, I only see like concept art and things of that nature. So what are some of your character development processes like? Um, honestly, I just do whatever the director tells me to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess I don't really have a process for myself personally uh, to get into character, but I mean, I don't know. I take a deep breath and I just channel that character and I don't know how to really describe it other than that. Okay. So then um, going into your coaching, what are some of the, the fundamentals of what you teach when you're teaching voiceover? I teach beginner voice acting classes and mm -hmm. basically these classes provide a chance to learn more about the professional voice acting industry and studios and the business of acting with your voice specifically. Um, it's a class that teaches newer voice actors how to navigate the industry, practice audition methods, learn the difference in performance techniques for various forms of voiceover, because there is a difference mm -hmm. depending on the genre of voiceover that you're doing, and even learning marketing strategies and discovering what social media can do for your business and your brand as a voice actor. Okay, gotcha. So... Um, what, what are some of the, the biggest um, branding things that you've learned over the years as far as um, ways to kind of gain your exposure over the internet? Mm, where do I even begin? <laughs> I know that's a very broad question. <laughs> well, hmm. Ask, ask it again so I can start thinking, because <laughs> okay. I know I have an answer for this, but... So what are some of the techniques that you utilize in order to stay relevant within the industry using social media? Oh, that's a really good, really well put question. Honestly, you just have to be really careful with how you conduct yourself online, mm -hmm. because the big companies are watching you. They are watching and, you know, just to make sure, you know, especially Disney, like if you want to work for a company that puts out content for kids, you got to be careful what you post online. <laughs> you got to, you know, be kid friendly. That's really important, I feel. And um, yeah, the target audience matters. And, you know, conduct yourself professionally. Um, don't start drama. Stay away from the drama. Um, be respectable to people online. Be nice. Because companies notice that. They, they dig around. They're looking for how you conduct yourself. Are you professional or are you an amateur? They can tell by your social media. So that's one huge thing that people need to be careful about. Okay. So um, I do a lot of ADR remote. Uh, remotely through, through Source Connect. But what is the process um, of... ADR work when you're actually walking into a studio? Like what is what is that environment and, and process and, and some of the biggest ne technicalities of that? Okay, for Funimation specifically, mm -hmm. walk in, you sign in so that they know you're there and then you wait for the director to call you in. Or sometimes, you know, if, if you know the director, you can just walk on through. But uh, yeah, you, you go into the booth and at Funimation specifically, there's two screens. There's one with the script that's... Um, vertical yeah and then the, then this and then they have another screen that has the animation which is horizontal and then you hear three beeps beep 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 and then you come in for your line or or various like multiple lines you get a preview of the scene and then you dub it right after you preview it in japanese um it's basically the process at funimation but yeah, so it's just really, for the most part, if you have a named character role, it's just you in the booth, and then there's the director telling you what to do, and then the audio engineer who's placing all the audio files, you know, splicing it up, making it fit, make sure it fits the animated mouth flaps, and yeah. Okay. So how do you think that simulcast has changed the dubbing industry? So 
for simul dubs, we no longer have to wait over a year before announcing our roles. <laughs> now we typically only have to wait a few weeks uh, because that's when it, it comes out much quicker than it used to. Mm -hmm. It's nice to be able to talk about a role you're currently working on because a lot of the times once the roles are announced, you recorded it a year ago. And so people will ask you questions. What was it like recording for such and such? And it's like, well, those sessions were a year ago. So I don't always remember those moments that people want me to remember. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, now I have quick answers because I'm still currently recording those roles. And that's really cool. I remember when I booked my first lead role in an anime series, I had to wait over a year to announce it. Jeez. So that was, oh, that was, obviously I kept it a secret, but it was still very hard because my heart just, oh, I was so excited about it. And I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be able to talk about it, but I had to wait. <laughs> Okay, so how do you think simulcast has changed the way people are able to get into the industry? Oof. Well, a lot of people are recording remotely now, which is great. So there are more opportunities for aspiring actors to get their foot in the door, no matter where they live. It used to be really harder because you had to live where the work is. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm assuming after this pandemic is over, you you are still going to have to live where the work is. But for now, it's nice that people can record remotely and still have those chances. The problem is there are some studios, now I'm going to be honest with you, there are some studios out there who say, oh, well, now that everyone's recording remotely, you guys should send us your demos. We want to expand our roster. <laughs> we want people from all over. It's, you know, we're not just recording out of Los Angeles anymore. You know, you'll see some studios saying, hey, send us your demos. Here's our email. Um, turns out some of those were just marketing ploys. You know, they're not really going to give people opportunities. They're just, they just want attention. So that sucks. Like, I... Yeah, so that is definitely a thing. There are some studios that just want attention and they're like, oh, look at us being inclusive. Look at us. Ooh, look at us. But they're really just trying to overcompensate for their la lack of diversity over the years. And yeah, so just um, be careful. There are some studios that, you know, they, uh, they like to pretend like they're helping you out, but they're not. Gotcha. Okay. So focusing more on ADR, what are some of the most difficult technical aspects of recording ADR for you? Matching those mouth flaps. Because <laughs> here's the thing. Sometimes my, sometimes I deliver a read. I deliver a performance that is just so spot on. And the director's like, yes, that's the one. That's the take. Beautiful. Perfect. And then the audio engineer will speak up and be like, yeah, it was great, but <laughs> the first sentence needs to be quicker, the second sentence needs to be slower, the third sentence needs to be such and such, and then we need to add a hitch here because there's a slight pause in the in the animation. Like, and you have to remember all of that in one go. You have to be able to do it again with all that in mind. Like, it's, um, man, sometimes you could be an incredible actor, you could be a phenomenal performer, and you could give a beautiful read just the perfect take but if it doesn't match those animated mouth flaps you're gonna have to do it again <laughs> and try it again and hope you get the same that you get the same flow out of that but sometimes the audio engineers help a ton they're able to sometimes shrink an audio bit you know shrink a bit or stretch it a bit if needed but for the most part artifacting happens if you do it too much and so there's only so much they can do without it sounding I guess, edited, which right. is not what you want. You want it to sound natural. So there are some times where we have to keep changing the script. Like, oh, no, we need to add a syllable. Oh, now we need to take away a syllable. What happened here? You know, there are moments like that in the booth. But for the most part, you know, just got to do your best as a performer, take direction well, and pray to God that it matches the flaps. <laughs> so what do you do... Um to to kind of practice those technical parts of it because my technique is i will watch a commercial 
and then I'll pause I'll, and then I'll rewind the commercial and then I'll pause it and then I'll try to almost ad lib it to match it. Do you kind of have a little practice thing that, that you do at home to kind of work on your ADR abilities? In all honesty, no, I just learned from experience. The more I dub professionally, the better I get at it. And I am fortunate enough that I've gotten enough, that I continue to get enough dubbing work that I haven't gotten rusty yet. There's, there hasn't been a moment where I felt like I needed to practice because thankfully I've been blessed with a lot of work right from the start. So yeah, I'm, I'm really um, fortunate. Gotcha. Okay. So how do you market yourself as a voiceover artist? Where, where do you go and, and search? Are you doing email marketing? Are you, are you making phone calls? How are you marketing yourself as a voiceover artist? I feel like sending out a ton of emails sometimes can, you kind of have to be careful sometimes. There are some studios that do not like that. And you definitely don't want to ruffle their feathers. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, in the commercial world, there tends to be a lot of hard selling, a lot of hard sells. Like, you got to make the calls. You got to send out all the emails. But that doesn't work in every area of voiceover. Mm -hmm. Like, for animation and video games, I find that that hard sell is, it doesn't, it doesn't work. <laughs> for commercials, it might, but definitely not for animation. Um so honestly, I just, you know, I got a, I got a voice demo produced and I built up my resume and that's when I started submitting to studios like in Los Angeles. Once I made the move to Los Angeles not too long ago, I decided, you know what, I, I'm going to, I feel like I have a good enough resume and some decent demos. I'm going to put my stuff out there and see what happens. But you do have to ask around, ask professionals and be like, hey, does so-and-so, does this studio accept cold submissions or no? And I've gotten the response of, oh, no, you need really big connections to get into there. Like, I've heard various different answers. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But you, you do have to be careful because um, there are some studios that if you take the hard sell route and you email them or send them a letter every few you know, every few weeks or every two months, sometimes it might end up annoying them. And that's not good. You do not want to annoy them. Uh, so definitely got to be careful depending on the studio. So it's good. It's important to ask around people, professionals in this industry who have connections to those studios and asking them, hey, how does this director, does this, is this director or this studio okay with me sending them my resume and demo? How does this work? So you just, got to ask around, ask people who actually have experience in the industry. Gotcha. Okay. So what made you want to start teaching beginners how the voiceover industry works? Because I kept seeing scams everywhere and it just made me <laughs> so mad, especially with the pandemic. So many people are thinking, oh, this is a great time for me to teach because then I can make some extra money on this. Uh, demo mills oh, and... Just for them, it's all about the money. And it's like, you know, they're just, golly, there's so many amateurs who ma manage to sucker, who manage to trick aspiring voice actors, you know, beginners in this industry that still don't know who they can trust. Right. So that's when the, that's when, that's when the scam artists come in and they're like, Hey, I could coach you. And then those poor beginner voice actors don't do their research and they're like, okay. And they take them up on the offer and they learn incorrect information, outdated information. It is so important to learn from someone who is booking today, not someone who booked 20 years ago and hasn't booked some anything since. Right. You got to learn from someone who is able to book today because these industry trends are always changing you don't want to learn outdated information from someone who is sorry a has-been right okay like it's so important to learn from someone who is able to book now because right. if they if they can't manage to book what makes you think they're going to help you book here's the thing you got to get on imdb if now specifically this works for animation and video games not so much commercials because there's really it's harder to find out 
people's credentials when it comes to commercials and promo. But you can easily get on IMDb and find animation work, video game work, uh, films. You can easily... For those genre of voiceover, you can easily find someone's credits. So, hey, if someone offers to coach you, look them up on IMDb. See what work they've done. Are, do they? How often do they book each month? When was the last time they booked? These are very important details. Are they an actor or a casting director? Because that matters too. There are some casting directors that teach, and they're phenomenal. Donna Grillo is incredible. Um, you know, learn from someone who is in this industry and is currently working. I think that is so, so important because I've just been seeing too many scams online and it just made me so mad that I was like, you know what? I'm gonna help some people out because it seems like this person was taught really bad information. They need help. I need, I need to set the record straight. You like, oh my God, do not read your lines out of order. Why did he tell you that? I have no idea. Out of order, what do you mean? Yes. Okay. There was one teacher in particular, I will not say his name, but he was saying, he was telling people, telling his students, read the lines out of order for your auditions. That way you'll stand out. That's not a thing. Don't do that. No. Don't do that. So yeah, um, learn from someone who's able to book now and in that specific genre of voiceover that you want to book, that you want to get in with. So for me, animation, video games, um, for Tracks West, and they're a studio located in Los Angeles. Yeah, and so different coaches specialize in different genres of voiceover, and you just got to choose the right one for you. Just make sure that they're actual professionals and they're not just amateurs pretending that they can help you when really those people are just in it for the money. So be very careful. Right. So what do you think some of the... um some recent pieces of information that have kind of been misguiding people that you've seen recently? Uh, well, the main one that I just mentioned was definitely reading the lines out of order. Excuse me. And also, if a teacher spends a three-hour class, one hour of that three-hour class, they're just talking about themselves and bragging about the celebrities they've worked with or whatever, if they're just name dropping for an entire hour of that three hour class, get out, get out. Like, no, there's a bunch of people in this class and you, here's the thing, there's only so much time right. in those classes. And if it's advertised that you get to read copy for this teacher and get critique, and there's like, if there's 15 students in this three hour class, and he spends an hour of that class bragging about himself. And then there's only two hours left for him to, for you guys to perform, for those 15 students to perform and then get critique. Not everyone's gonna, by the end of the class, maybe not even half of them have gotten up to the mic to perform and get critique. So most of the students have learned nothing by the end of it. So it's just very, uh, I don't wanna get into too much detail, but right. there's a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation. I'm There's still, a lot of people getting taken advantage of, and I don't like that. I'm still stuck on the lines that it work because the casting director isn't going to listen to all of your audition all the time. They're going to scroll through it, and because they have 500 auditions to go through, so if they hear, oh, well, maybe he skipped a line, then they're going to pass it on. <laughs> exactly. It's ridiculous. I, I don't know why he teaches that. I'm just that's never been a thing. Never. I've even asked around, I'm like, hey, was this a thing back in the day? And it's just, and it's just a trend that died out? Because that's just, and they're like, no, that's never been a thing. And, okay. I don't know why he's teaching people this, but. Yeah, I've heard that some people do, um, they'll look at the line, they'll look at the, the voice description of what the casting director wants, and they'll give them something completely off the wall before. I recommend sending the... two takes. I always recommend for your first take, right. Do what the director says, you know, right. do it exactly right. what you want. And then give a second take where you try something different because here's the thing. Here's the thing. These casting directors are listening to hundreds of auditions coming in. Okay. And all of them probably sound the same, right? Mm -hmm. Same reads, same vocal type. Mm -hmm. But hey, if you give out a take two, trying something a little different, it will stand out and maybe... They might prefer it. 
Maybe they realize, oh, that's the direction we want to take it. Brilliant. Let's bring this actor in. So right. it's always good to show them variety. Right. Always. So if you were to write a letter to yourself before you had started in voiceover, when you were only in acting, before you had started, um, before your Todd Heppercorn audition um, award, I'll call it, um, what would that letter to yourself say? Be patient. <laughs> You're not always going to accomplish your goals right away, and that's okay. Just focus on yourself and do the best you can. Your time will come. Just be patient. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Morgan. Hey, thank you. I really hope you enjoyed listening to Morgan talk about her experiences in the dubbing industry and some of the key factors that will help you stand out online as an actor. If you'd like to know more about Morgan, you can visit her at www.themorganberry.com. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The VoiceOver Coffee Shop. For more information on guests, new episodes, and more, be sure to visit www.vocoffeeshop.com.